Our speaker today is Daniel World. He's professor of politics who has been teaching at UCLC for 30 years. Since he started in 1988. He writes and teaches around some interesting subjects. Congress, the Senate, the military policy, separation of powers, and American political history. He's the author of four books, The Federalist Papers and Institutional Power in American Political Development. Irrational Security, The Politics of Defense from Reagan to Obama, and co-author of The Invention of the United States Senate. He was a winner of two teaching awards uh, in 1993 and 1994 at UCSC. Uh, he was a congressional fellow and served as a legislative assistant to Lee Hamilton and Senator Chris Dodd. He currently serves on the National Board of the Council for a Livable World, the oldest and largest anti-nuclear weapons political action committee. Beyond work and family, Dan is a competitive triathlete, swimmer, and runner. In recent years, he focused on swim, run races. referred to as a <laughs> At the International Triathlon Union World Championships, he won gold twice. Uh, in 2015, this is in interests affect the formation and course of military policy, 
And then also, in turn, how the implementation of military policy affects domestic politics, so both sides of that equation. And this is, you can see, as part and parcel of a larger question that historians and political scientists have dealt with over the years. And one way of phrasing that is, what is the work that wars do, right? What do wars do? And really not just wars, but preparation for wars and related matters. In short, to paraphrase the historical sociologist Charles Tilley, states make war, but wars also make states. And some of you are familiar with this and works, especially from European history, you know, the study of how states indeed made war, but in many ways the wars they produced or the military preparations they involved themselves in also made the state shape what kind of states they were, what kind of nations they were. And many of you are, again, in some ways probably familiar with some of the authors, you know, David Kennedy, Brian Downey, and others, if you've read some history, who, who studied these kinds of questions. So one might ask, you know, now that we're over 16 years past September 11th, 2001, and 16 years into the forever, what, what some people now call the forever wars that the United States has evolved itself in, that followed the events of those days, it's time to take stock, or you might think it's time to stay, take stock, of the consequences for American politics and government of those policies and decisions we made following 9-11. You know, insofar as there was a post-Cold War era, that's over, right? But what exactly has replaced it? Where are we now? Is it simply a sort of enhanced version of the Cold War state? Or is it something new in both scale and quality? This is sort of a tricky thing to study in a way, A, because it's still fairly new. It's hard to say what will endure and what won't. It's also tricky because it's all been during the same years of tremendous technological and other forms of changes across the world, right? So sometimes it's a little hard to figure out what cause and effect is. Is this sort of a result of the wars and our policies, or are things more general effects of the this era of social acceleration we're living in more generally. So I'm dealing with that too. And you know, that's worth keeping in mind that this is not a presentation of my done research, that you know, this is not a finished project. This is something I'm really just starting based on the previous work I've done on US military policy and its effects. So let's begin by thinking about, you know, you, we used World War II as an example of this idea of what, what is the work that wars do. And as you all know, the New Deal and the response to it in the 1930s by the Roosevelt administration created the, war, the welfare state, right, which the United States hadn't had before. It was a fundamental transformation of the American you know, government and society. And really, in some ways, the, the contours of this and the shape of this was clear by the end of Roosevelt's second term. And then not much later, World War II, and then especially the first years of the Cold War, created the warfare state, you know, something the United States had not had before in any way, shape, or form in its past. Another fundamental transformation, in many ways evident by the end of the Truman administration, of the Truman presidency. So we can begin by thinking about you know, what you might call the analog warfare state, which I just say is, you know, a, a roughly speaking 1942, and you know, petering out somewhere in the 1990s. That is, I don't want to say that everything that happened after 9-11 you know, started right after 9-11. Some of the developments I'm talking about predate 9-11 a little bit. But to get to the analog warfare state, you know, we all know, I'll move a little bit. We all know that, that the United States involved itself in, for the first time in its history, in these policy commitments related to sort of global military superiority, permanent mobilization of our military forces, and all organized around the fundamental policies of containment and deterrence, right? That is, that we weren't really necessarily going to fight a lot of big wars, but our primary job was to prevent war, especially with the Soviet Union, right? So, so can you, you see this okay? Sorry. So, another side of this, of course, was our commitment to global military superiority. And that was anchored, of course, by the nuclear arsenal and the global reach of conventional forces. Right? And again, structured to deter or, if necessary, fight World War III. Clearly, you all know this involved the, the, the executive center of government in so many ways, 
you know, American presidents in the past in American history have been powerful episodically, but there have never been sort of the kind of serious and permanent advancement of presidential power we had until World War II and the Cold War. We, of course, have the rise of secrecy in our country, you know, for the first time, the kind of institutionalization of secrecy, black budget, black operations like the CIA, and kind of the analog version of the intelligence complex. And we, of course, we have the, the creation of what many people call, and I'll talk about today, the military-industrial complex, that is, this private-public arsenal producing um, kind of set of institutions dominated by you know, as I say up there, the kind of metal bending heavy industry that produced our weapons. It wasn't just that, but that was an important part of it. And then finally, you might say the politics of all this organized kind of around what I call this kind of primacy perception complex. We, politics and politicians always had to uphold this idea that we were supreme, it did not be the perception or the illusion that we were always supreme and in control. And of course, for many years, uh, even after Vietnam at different times, we have this kind of version of the Cold War consensus that sort of organized politics around this. And in some ways, as you all know, this is in the context of what I'll term here the greatest inve investment, right? If World War II produced the greatest uh, generation, as it's often said, it also produced the greatest investment, right? Which was the simultaneous creation of the United States as the sort of industrial and technological superpower in the world, at the same time as basically World War II wiped out all our competition for a while, right? and that produced many of the things that made all this possible. Right? So we all know that, you know, roughly speaking, that's what World War II and the Cold War produced. And in many ways, the question is, you know, what did 9-11 produce? And we can begin to talk about 9-11, and I'll just list some things, and then I'll focus after listing all these, listing them, focus on a few key ones that I think have affected us domestically. One way of looking at this is to see how 9-11 changed the world, right? And that's important, I'm not diminishing the importance of that. My focus instead, as I've tried to make clear, will be on sort of what's an initial understanding of how it's transformed the United States politics and government. So, you know, obviously we have an open-ended commitment and then sort of to endless conflict based on, in this case, on punishment and prevention. You know, notice that's very different from containment and deterrence. You know, the wars, based the wars on terror, are all about either prevention, trying to prevent a future attack, or punishing. We just go out and punish people over and over and over again, hoping that'll make them stop. And that certainly produces a different kind of warfare and a different kind of set of institutions around warfare. We've transformed military power. I think we could spend, you know, a whole lecture or more talking just about this, you know, the transformation of military power in the form of, you know, what some people will refer to as networked and capital intensive warfare, right? Where all your forces are hooked up to computers, they're all organized by this kind of network centric warfare. And we're, of course, entering this era of robotic and semi-autonomous warfare. And some of you maybe you know, know as well as I do that we've kind of arrived there. I mean, again, you could do a whole presentation about how, after 9-11, we really accelerated into the future as far as the development of robotic and, and sort of now autonomous warfare. You know, it's not just the drones that fly around that are guided by people. We are now developing weapons that can basically run and make decisions on their own. We have the Commander-in-Chief's Global Lethal Warrant and his Global Police Force, which I'll talk about in more depth in a minute. We have really the, you know, the creation of the digital surveillance state. It didn't exist before 9-11, and now it does in many ways, shapes, and forms. And by the way, in this list, I'm neither characterizing these things as good nor bad. <laughs> they just sort of are, right? And some of them are terribly important. You know, and then we have what, what I'll talk about as well a little bit later on, is the sort of horizontal expansion and vertical integration of national security. That is, in many ways, we're spread more around the globe than we've ever been before, as far as the military, in more places. And at home, we've vertically integrated national security by connecting our local law enforcement to our national sort of security apparatus in ways that never existed before. And then we have 
what you know I'll call the shift from the military industrial complex to the national security capitalist complex. That is what I'll talk about, is how in some ways it's a very different kind of relationship between the political and economic forces of this country as far as the production of military hardware and military services than the Cold War. Not completely different, but important enough. And then I'll end on this point later on about this sort of bizarre kind of situation we're in, where we have in a sense this incredible military apparatus, you know, able to project around the world and do these incredible things, even if we don't end up exactly winning the wars, right? So we have this incredible military power of prowess abroad, but at home we have this gridlock and deadlock in our politics, and I'll talk about the consequences that leads to. And as I say, we have this sort of great exception, which is this combination of partisan polarization on everything except for national security. Notice, we talked about this, right? We can, I hope, with the questions. When you think about it, you know, the two parties are polarized and fighting each other about everything. What really aren't they fighting each other about and haven't been? This, right? It's basically not part of the national conversation. All right. So, you know, this gets at a couple quick, I'll make a couple quick points that political scientists and historians and sociologists <laughs> point out that one of the things that the types of work war does is it accelerates things. You know, we get launched into the future faster than we would have otherwise. It's what World War II did in many realms of technology, and then that has economic effects. And 9-11 in some ways has done similar things, especially with like the surveillance state and the autonomous weapons. For our purposes, another thing it does is what the, these folks have called ratchet effects, like a ratchet where you, you pump the handle and things go up, and then they don't come back down again, right? Meaning during wars, governments are able to do fabulous things very quickly in a way they couldn't do before, and then the war's over and, oh, we're not going back, right? We're staying sort of where we are. You know, one of the great historical examples of this, and it seems very mundane compared to some of the things up on the board there, is, you know, tax withholding, since we just had tax reform, right? As many of you probably know, you know, during World War II, we, Congress passed an act that mandated withholding, which we hadn't had before from the income tax. That was a war measure to get revenue in on a more quick and regular basis. Of course, World War II ended. Did that go away? Of course not, right? You know, that like so many other things, you know, and you could of course point to things like this of a more direct, you know, or more, you know, direct relationship to national security, you know, like elements of the, the secrecy and so forth that were necessary during war, but then war went away and all of that stayed, right, and so on and so forth. So let's talk about um, the first. What I want to do now is concentrate on three things that I don't, I'm not listing them because I think they're absolutely the most important changes since 9-11, uh, but I think they are important. So what I want to do is concentrate on sort of three things uh, where we sort of left ourselves in the wake of 9-11 and the forever wars. So the first is this, what I, you know, and I gave you an outline there. The first is a sort of new political economy of military spending and the politics that it produces. Now you remember after the Cold War ended, we had this kind of, lull in military spending. The military budget actually went down reasonably significantly after the Reagan military buildup and after the Cold War ended. But the American political system responded only sort of incompletely to that opportunity. And you know, part of the argument I'll make later on is that neither of the two parties, but especially the Democratic Party, never really came up with a clear alternative to the kind of Cold War system that would justify further cuts in military spending. So, the question is, what did 9-11 do as far as military spending? And the reason that isn't self-evident is because I think if you read the news, right, or hear a lot of political talk, and it's not just on Fox News, you'd think military spending has been cut a lot. Like, our military has no money, right, you know, and, and, and we're desperate for new money from the military. Trump came in and promised, you know, new money for the military to rebuild the military Obama had broken. So at, at large, politically, there is definitely the perception that somehow the wars ended, basically, and now the military needs to be rebuilt. Right? Well, that's one of the things I'm going to challenge here a little bit. So as, as you know, 
from here's 2001 all the way to 2017, but the year we're, you know, fiscal year, last full fiscal year is 2016, right? Here we are, you know, showing the, the military spending increases, or one version of them, after 9-11. And this, what these bars combine is both the base budget of the Pentagon, the blue bars, and the separately passed war spending. OCO stands for, as some of you know, Overseas Contingency Operations. So what that is is that separate <laughs> pot of money Congress passed every year after 2001 to fund essentially the net costs of the war. And this is, again, unique in American history to build in systematically, as an institutional change, this kind of separate pot of money to fund the wars. So this is the Pentagon's base budget. That does not include, as I think I note up here, some parts of the true military budget. When I say true military budget, exactly what the military budget is, not like I'm throwing other things in. This is just the way the Pentagon likes to show their budget, like just what the Pentagon controls. But you do have to add in, for example, the Department of Energy, about $17 billion a year that's spent in the Department of Energy. They're simply for military purposes, nuclear weapons. Right? So that's not in these parts. But you can see a couple things. One is the obviously huge size of these supplemental appropriations for the wars at the same time that the military budget itself was growing by leaps and bounds, right? Enormous change. So then you can also see that when the wars started to finally wind down, right, this stays about the same, right, the Pentagon's base budget, and it is still way above here, even if you adjust for inflation, and I'll show that. What gets smaller, really, are just the war appropriations, right? Because the wars were winding down. Well, that makes sense. That is still a whopping amount of money, $59 billion, for wars you're barely supposedly fighting anymore. How big is that? Well, here's one way. We'll go to this first. As you know, the United States clearly leads the world in military spending. Right? But this is one graph that shows you know, that comparison, and a lot of you are familiar with it, but what I do here is I show the full US amount, including the Department of Energy and, and other things directly. They're all part of the national military budget. So in FY16, we're about at $622 billion authorized. But if you take away the war spending, we're still at 563, rather significantly above China and everyone else, most of whom, of course, are our closest allies. And notice I put the overseas contingency operation, the war budget, as just a separate column, the part that's missing here, down here to show it's the world's fifth largest military budget just what we spend on the wars. The net, inc you know, net increment we pass to fund the wars. And this, by the way, as you remember, is one of the, it's, it's one of the smaller gray bars up here. Over, those, over the decade from 2001 to 2012, when things began to decrease, this average, the gray bars averaged $113 billion a year just to fund the wars. All right. I say that somewhat facetiously, because as some of you know, those gray bars that I showed have been used to supplement the regular defense budget. It's been a bit of budgetary chicanery. They, they called it war spending, but it was really a backdoor way to fund other things the Pentagon wanted. And that's been well documented. That's not a conspiracy theory. You can read about that in many locations. So here, as it is, here it is adjusted for inflation. U.S. military spending from 1950 in the Korean War all the way through Vietnam, Reagan's buildup, and then the wars of Iraq, Afghanistan, and the global war on terror, G1. So you can see we reached a peak that hadn't been reached since World War II. You know, you can't put World War II in the same graph adjusted for inflation. You just can't, because right? it's somewhere up here, okay? But, you know, so you leaving World War II out to make the graph readable, you can see that we set this new record for both the about, you know, if you look at the area under the curve, and the height of our military spending during this period, right? And we've come down, yes, because we're no longer fighting the enormous war in Iraq and what was for a while an enormous war in Afghanistan. But notice, we're still spending in, in inflation-adjusted dollars about the top, the peaks of the periods during the Cold War, right? And you, I could 
name and point out other comparisons to show how this is the case. Right? So we saw this one, and again, happy to answer any questions about the data. I created all these graphs, and they're all from either government data or other sources. All the numbers about the Pentagon come directly from the Pentagon or the Office of Management and Budget. Why are um, the orange ones orange? Oh, that's because those supposedly are our enemies, right? And just to show that that when you look at this whole array of, of you know other countries, most of them are our closest allies. We wouldn't be fighting, right? So, how well, about if you, sure. But how about if you compare building an equivalent battleship, the cost of China versus yeah. the cost of the? That's what some people argue. A, this is always an estimate. China doesn't tell us, right? You know, budget. We're sort of. They, they estimate, and this is a pretty generous, I mean, they're, they're trying real hard to be fair about that kind of thing. So the question is, yeah, if you did sort of in cost equivalents, how high would this bar go? You know, that's the kind of thing that maybe the CIA works on a bit, but that's meant to be kind of a fair comparison. It's mostly that, you know, they don't pay folks much, right? You know, a big part of China's military budget is they don't pay folks much. We pay folks quite a bit, right? We also do many things a lot of countries don't do. We train quite a bit, not just because we're at war. We actually train quite a bit. There's some other militaries in the world that they're there, they've got equipment. Mm, you know, whether or, not, whether or not things would go well if they got in the, the fighter and went anywhere is another story. The U.S. is one of the few countries that can afford to actually train as well as we do. Israel, of course, being another. Right? So, one thing I'd like to say is that, or add to this, is it's not just about the Pentagon. It's not just about the Department of Energy. One thing I think Americans are totally unaware of, there's this vague idea that we have a lot of veterans, and the veterans from these wars have a lot of needs, and the Veterans Affairs Department has had problems treating our veterans or giving them the services they deserve. This is what I think a lot of Americans don't know. This is just the VA budget. Which, as you know, is a totally separate department. It has nothing to do with the military spending I showed earlier. Look at this. From the year 2000 to 2016, the VA's budget goes from just under 50 to over $160 billion. Rising faster than the Pentagon's budget. Okay. Rising faster than the Pentagon's budget, even with the war spending. Now, what you might begin to think about, and this is what I'm puzzling through, this is actually a tricky puzzle to solve. Why did this go up so quickly? It wasn't just because we were war and we were producing more veterans. Notice how fast it's going up so early in the wars. Do you see what I mean? Way too fast. That is, part of this is not demand-driven, it's supply-driven. Just like Congress passed more and more money through the Pentagon because they couldn't say no. They also passed more and more generous funding for the VA, benefits and other things, because you had to, right? You couldn't say no. And I'm not saying the money's been wasted or that it's ill-used or that we shouldn't do this, but I think few Americans are you know, aware of the extent to which the VA has now become you know, essentially this other large outcome of the wars on terror. One way of showing this is to show you this diagram again, military spending adjusted for inflation, now we'll add in the VA over the same historical period. What you can see, of course, is that from 1950, where we had a peak after World War II, and then a little peak after Vietnam, now adjusted for inflation, look where we are now. That is, this is $158 billion adjusted in $2,009 and climbing. That is, all the estimates about where VA spending is going is it's going to still climb for several more years at least due to the both the supply but also the demand. That is, the veterans will get more and more services because we've produced all these veterans that will require expensive services and that will probably grow. VA spending is very complicated because you also have, of course, the World War II generation, the Korea generation, and the Vietnam generation essentially, you know, leaving us and, de and departing, and that changes things too. And that's part of it as well. Is that correct back there? How does that compare to uh, total Chinese military spending of VA? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is, you know, so if you look at, if in, in, let's say, current dollars, 
forget the 158. We're about like 180 this year for VA, and China was about 215 billion. So our total spending on VA is comparable to the Chinese military budget, right? And again, my point is this is neither good nor bad, but it's an outcome of these wars, and it's a, it has consequences. That's, of course, money we can't spend on other things, and it's politically untouchable in a sense, right? We're committed to this for maybe very good reasons, but we're also committed to it just because, you know? Sorry, is that if you want to... Yeah, what does that right. line look like on a per capita basis? Well, that's one thing I'm working on right now. <laughs> and, and you know what? You go on the Department of Defense's website, you can find virtually anything you want to find. They just have numbers and data. It's all over the place. The VA's website, oh my god, it's so opaque. So trying to find VA data that's like this historical data is very difficult, especially about numbers. So finding the number of veterans who are using services, what services they're using, and therefore get into Frank's question, is Frank back there, yeah. right? You know, that idea of how much are we spending per veteran. My initial calculation is, it's a lot more, like a lot more, it you would, know? It would be going up. Yes, it, yeah, definitely. So the question is exactly how and for what. And just very quickly, because I don't want to spend my whole time on the VA, interesting as this is, and as important as I think it is, is that, you know, part of this is, it's not just the medical part, right? The VA is spending a lot of money on medical treatment, as it should. But the other component, and I think it is still the bigger component, is compensation. That is, the VA gives out awards compensation for veterans in various forms, including survivors of veterans, forms of retirement. It's not a retirement plan, but it's a supplement retirement if you're poor and a veteran, or relatively poor, and forms levels of compensation depending on your injury, the level of your injury. As some of you know, literally, you, you, you file with the VA and you get a rating of, let's say, 15% disabled and your compensation is based on that. So that's a huge part of this as well, all right? So again, I'm happy to answer the questions as we go or at the end. So what I'd like to do now is talk about well, what has this done in other ways? And just one thing I want to touch on fairly quickly is I think it really has changed that military-industrial complex from a military-industrial complex to a kind of national security capitalist complex. Because the interests involved in all this now go way beyond simply those metal bending industries that dominated the military industrial complex during the Cold War. So here, you know, I'll give you a quick example. If you look at the top 25 defense contractors in 2013, that's just, I just picked a year that was at least fairly close to when the wars were still at their height. What you can see is there's a lot of the usual suspects here, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, and they still bend metal. They're still building the weapons of war. But actually, look who else is here in a way that wasn't the case so much during the Cold War. You have things like tech services, IT, engineering, logistics, fuel, food supply chain, and healthcare, and a lot of, you know, cyber sort of support and stuff. And my point there is the nature of war has changed. And as the nature of war has changed, so have the companies involved in this. They've evolved and changed. Now even Lockheed Martin and, and Northrop and even some of these others, but especially those two, they do it all. They realize the action was everywhere in the military, so they diversify too. Uh, Lockheed Martin does IT support. They do you know lots of other things besides bending metal and building sort of sometimes not so good weapons like the F-35 fighter. Um, so this has changed by broadening, in a sense, the array of interests that are now tied into Pentagon spending. I think it's different from in the past. And this is also even the case with, let's say, look at the VA, this is the Veterans Administration, their top 20. Now the VA is, is different from the Pentagon because the VA is largely a check writing operation. Do you know what I mean? The VA sent me, they send out checks to various people, healthcare companies, veterans, and so forth. Even so, there's some serious money to be made in the VA. IT support, healthcare administration, and then our biggie up here, McKesson. Does anyone remember McKesson from the news recently? Yeah, yeah they're up to, they're in hot water because of the opioid. Yeah. 
And, they, and, and, and that's what they do. They're a distributor, essentially, of pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical management. And um, these two things are possibly not unrelated, right? You know, I mean, in the sense that they produce, they, they distribute pharmaceuticals, and they've been involved in maybe mismanaging the opioids in such a way that they're being turning a blind eye to their misuse. And certainly, those kind of medicines and stuff are involved in the VA. So, they, and the yellow ones, as I say down here, I only highlighted the yellow ones because you can see the overlap. That is, some of the same big companies that are involved in the Pentagon, like Lockheed Martin and Booz Allen, are also involved in the VA. And I'm not trying to say this is not a conspiracy theory. These people are making money. This is a way to make money. But it's new and different in the sense that it's not just that the Pentagon's interests have gotten more diversified, it's now spread more to the VA, and now you can add, and I'll talk about this in a minute, the Department of Homeland Security. If you look at their chart like this, the same actors show up. And also, in some cases, the Department of Energy and even the State Department, okay? So that's, that's one major change, you know, in terms of 9-11. This, it, it's elevated our military weapons to this new plateau, and politically that has the effect of setting a new marker, a kind of standard. This is where military spending should be. And so any, any attempt to bring that down is measured again against where we were on that mountaintop. This happened at other points in American history. And the political danger is, is that becomes the kind of standard and so people are afraid to go far, too far below that standard, right? And in fact, you know, that's part of the problem we're facing with the military spending is, is it's at a very high level, but because it did come down, as I showed before, because the wars were ending, it allows people to make the claim, oh, we're cutting military spending. Well, yeah, the wars are ending, right? Aren't we supposed to be cutting military spending? But instead of phrasing it that way, we're doing what we should do. Most of the rhetoric you hear is, oh my God, we're cutting, we're undercutting the military, right? We're, we're not spending enough. Uh, this was absolutely the case, even the Obama administration. There was a lot of talk about how, even people would say quite directly, well, now that the wars are going away, we have to remember to keep military spending high. You know, it's almost like that, because those gray bars for the wars were shrinking, let's remember to make up for that. Right, in the military budget. So, we'll talk more about that later. So next, what I'd like to do is talk about this. You might ask, what's this a map of, right? So my next big change that I want to talk about is if the Cold War gave the president the presidential power many tools, one of which was the CIA. Anyone want to guess what this represents and fill in the blank? What is 9-11 given the president as a new tool that's sort of like the CIA. NSA. Well, it's true, the NSA is part of this, but this map represents special forces, all right? JSOC, the Joint Special Operations Command, and the thing above it, SOCOM, the Special Operations Command. This is a map of all the countries in the world that SOCOM forces were deployed in, all right? And you can see it says 138 nations, uh, many of which were acknowledged by SOCOM, and then a couple we all know that are there, like Syria and so forth. So what does this signify? Well, let me back up a second. Before 9-11, special forces were just that, special. They were small, specialized, used for a limited number of missions. 9-11 and the wars come along, and SOCOM becomes essentially, evolves into our fifth military service. You know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, SOCOM, right, and JSOC. One measure, SOCOM now boasts about 70,000 personnel. Those are not all fighters, they're not all super warriors, but 70,000. Great Britain's Army, 80,000. West Germany's army, not navy, but army, 65,000. SOCOM alone, right? Just our special forces, somewhere around 70,000 in the whole organization. Right? A subset of that is JSOC. Those, that's the command that controls, you know, the, the special forces and then like the Green Beret, 
the Navy SEAL teams that we all hear about and see in movies. Right? So this doesn't mean we're doing military actions in all these countries. Some of these people are just there learning a language or you know, seeing what's going on in a very benign way. But in many of these countries, we're actually doing something. So as, it's a little low there, but I'll read it to you. In 2014, William McRaven, who was commander of the Special Operations Command at the time, said that the U.S. is in the, quote, golden age of special operations, oh, yeah. right? Interesting terminology, right? Well, one of the things about this, or what this conveys, is that in many ways, this has supplanted so much else about our military. This is how we do things now. And so notice how it falls between the CIA and the sort of regular armed forces and fits into this niche of presidential power in a special way. Right? Yes? If the map of the United States was there, would there be blue dots? Oh, yeah, there are. But that's just because that's because we have something called NORTHCOM, the North American Command. And occasionally these folks are deployed to NORTHCOM. They aren't we think, doing anything in terms of military action, right? But they are occasionally given over to NORTHCOM. Yeah, sorry, Michael. Also, the saw dates in Europe. Yeah, and that's that's mostly because they do training and other things there, and they're stationed there. Yeah, yeah, so again, most the action is in the likely places, but notice as part of this idea of the, the vast expansion, one of the biggest places they are and are doing things which we were never before. We were not in Africa. We did not have an Africa command until after 9-11. Now we have Africa, and we're there. And who's there? JSOC. That's who's there. Anything in South America? Yeah, yeah, it was, oh, absolutely. Yeah, South America kind of got cut off, sorry. Yeah, couldn't fit it all on the slide. Absolutely sorry, yeah. Whose budget does this come under? This is absolutely the Pentagon's budget, and JSOC and, and SOCOM are both, you know, part of the Pentagon, and so what happens is essentially you're both taking soldiers who, let's say, like you're a Navy SEAL. You get paid by the Navy, you see what I mean? You're a Navy SEAL or you're an Army Green Beret, but you are assigned to JSOC. Does that make sense? But then JSOC, let's say, has its own budget, for its own weapons in many cases. It's got its own intelligence basis. That is, it doesn't just draw intelligence from the CIA or the NSA. JSOC has its own intelligence apparatus. So that leads perfectly to my last point about this, which it's now become this sort of self-contained, right, army, armed force, and very secretive. And this is the key point, not totally legal from a constitutional standpoint. That is, the CIA technically has to report its operations. The president has to sign a directive. Congress has to be notified of CIA covert operations. JSOC is essentially doing covert, the absolute equivalent of covert operations, all over the world, and there is no congressional notification, and Congress really doesn't care. It's slipped through the legal cracks of its fabulous growth and deployment around the world. So that's what, that's a real problem in a way that we've created this kind of thing that in some ways is way more powerful than the CIA. Certainly way more active than the CIA in operational terms. And yet is largely unsupervised. The president knows what's going on and the president in theory can control this. But that's about the size of it. Right? There's a lot more to it. I'll leave it at that. Let me just quickly cover what the sort of last one of this, I think, yeah, um, which is the third major change that I talk about is, of course, the great surveillance state we've created. And now it's really the cyber surveillance state. You know, it has so many levels, and this is where, of course, the NSA and other groups come in. You know, we've, we've given ourselves the capabilities and the institutional kind of capabilities and, of course, the budgets to essentially sweep up and go through all sorts of information worldwide and at home. And we barely know what we're doing in the sense that the American public barely has any understanding, you know, if it weren't for Edward Snowden and a few other people, of the extent of this. And again, I'm not saying this is either good nor bad, either good or bad, but it is certainly different from the Cold War. 
where it's much more of an analog sort of surveillance state that have kind of limited capabilities to monitor all our activities or all this activity. Now we've really you know, made a quantum leap upward and forward to be able to do this kind of, again, big data surveillance based on you know, some rather formidable capabilities. Right? So one thing I'd emphasize here, the NSA is its own thing, and we could talk about that a little bit, is you know, the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, which I think sort of symbolizes the kind of bureaucratic institutionalization of 9-11 at home and the kind of you know, the Department of Homeland Security, right? And just so, just so you know, one of the things they do is fusion centers, they create these fusion centers, and this is what I'm trying to get at with this idea of the vertical integration. You know, not only do we have a surveillance state like the NSA, but for the first time in really American history, we've sort of vertically integrated that surveillance state. And one, one aspect of this are fusion centers, which are these local centers in regions around the country that local law enforcement communicate and interact with nation, national entities, including the FBI, and can draw on data and submit data to them and so forth. Again, this might be good. We might be doing things we should have been doing before. But one of the reason I put this up is just for this, really. I like this. This is the Southeast Florida Fusion Center. Their symbol here, of course, is the appropriate combination of the red, white, and blue eagle and the sun and the beach, right? But I love this. Acting locally, thinking locally, right? It's like they expropriate. It's like cultural appropriation, right? You know, they took this hippy-dippy saying from like, the environmental movement and <laughs> applied it to national security. <laughs> um, you, see things like, you see things like that all over the place. I like this one. But if I had to pick a symbol of sort of the institutionalization of 9-11 at home, it's of course the Department of Homeland Security. And some of you know this, but many Americans don't. You know, they're building a new headquarters in Anacostia, right across from the river from the main part of the capital in Washington, D.C. And as you can see down here, it's a little off the edge. It's the largest construction project in Washington since the Pentagon. And this part is mostly the Coast Guard. But this is the St. Elizabeth Hospital site up here. And this was part of St. Elizabeth Hospital in Washington. It's kind of over here. And it's Mammoth, this Mammoth construction project. It's like a $4 billion construction project. And of course, they're behind schedule and over budget and the usual kind of things. But this symbolizes, in a sense, this institutionalization of this part of the security state in this new department, the Homeland Department of Homeland Security, which is about $50 billion a year, is what we spend on DHS. And as you know, DHS contains immigration, secret service, and other entities you know, related to internal security. But now it's sort of under one roof. Right? So that's, that's you know, that. So that, that created is the military come to look and act more like a police organization. So you have a very high-tech police organization, a very expensive one. You know, it's like a global law enforcement agency that is dominated by activity that is like well-armed, aggressive policing. We do counterinsurgency with SWAT-like arrests and killings. We use drones to target individuals whose deaths are sanctioned by legal warrants. And notice the linguistic term. Who do we go after? How many times have you heard this term? Who are we going after? Bad guys. Bad guys used to be the people we went after at home. Now they're the people we go after abroad. Does that make sense, kind of, right? And then my second sort of big set of changes, and again, these are sort of suggestive, they're kind of speculative, but they seem to be based on you know, something that is going on. If you look at sort of conflict worldwide and the nature and control of military force, if you think about World War II and the Cold War and nuclear weapons, that was really a moment of history. You know, a kind of short moment in history where military force was public, centralized, and nation states had a fairly firm grip on the control of military power. But that actually was kind of only around during those years. You go back in history any further, and you lose that, right? But this is a moment where we have that. Now, see, <coughs> nuclear weapons were kind of the symbol of this. No one else should control them, right? Nuclear weapons have to be in the control of nation states, and only a few nation states, preferably only one. <laughs> but now, after 9-11, what does this produce? Well, this is more speculative, but there are elements of truth to this. 
That is, we've had this sort of partial privatization of military force and the decentralization of military technology and power. You know, so you have things like private military firms that can be hired by various countries to help them organize, build, use their military power. That's a growth, outgrowth of 9-11, is these, there's a whole series of companies around the world that you can rent, essentially, to help you organize and use your military power. We have things like drones that come to symbolize this idea that anyone can have drones, anyone can use them, and in fact, they are proliferating, they are very cheap, and they're fairly technologically sophisticated. And they can be used as weapons, not just by firing a missile, but by, of course, using, let's say, swarms of drones. That was the thing that was supposedly going on in Syria. But you can use swarms of drones to, like, confuse, confound your enemy. And that's fairly low tech these days. And then, of course, we have cyber war, which anyone can do, in a way. And so, overall, as 9-11 accelerated us towards this era, where, in a sense, military force, in some ways, or military capacities, have, are being sort of decentralized, or they're much harder to contain than they were before. Okay. We will see. So let me end on this note, and this is the last thing on your outline, which is the sort of political problem we face, or as I think I put it, political predicament. Right? There's so much to say about this, but I'll just focus on one thing. That is, with all this I've covered, and you know, you know, a lot of other things you could add to this, I think the biggest problem we face in some ways is that we don't really have any organized political opposition to this. And what I mean by that, I'll, you know, I'll talk mostly in terms of the political parties, and in particular the Democratic Party. That is, if you look at it this way, after the Cold War ended, and especially when uh, Bill Clinton became president, the Democratic Party kind of went to sleep on national security issues. It would take care of itself. The Cold War was ended. We don't need to talk about it. We don't need to come up with an alternative. Military spending is dropping naturally. We're good to go. Let's focus on home, the homeland, right? Well, in a similar way, when Obama became president, the wars, Obama was going to end the wars. This was all going to sort of naturally deteriorate and go away. We'd focus on home. And what did the Democratic Party do? Nothing as far as an alternative vision, really, of national security, and especially a critique of how much military spending we had. Again, I'm not saying that's totally right or wrong, that we should cut this much or that much, but we should at least be having a conversation about it, given how much we are spending, and the kind of commitments we made as far as veterans and other forms of spending as a result of 9-11. Okay? So I'll end on what I think are the very fine words of a journalist, many of you know, James Fallows, who in 2015 turned, to, turned this problem, one term he used for it, was we've become a chicken hawk nation. Let me see if I'm in the right place. Come back to it later. This has become the way we assume the American military be discussed by politicians. Overblown, limitless praise, absent the caveats or public skepticism we would apply to other American institutions, especially ones that run on taxpayer money. This reverent but disengaged attitude towards the military, etc., has become so familiar that we assume it is the American norm. And then finally, we are the chicken hawk nation. Based on the derisive term for these, those eager to go to war as long as someone else is going to do the fighting, it's the story of a country willing to do anything for its military except take it seriously. Right? The idea being there that you know you can support the military. You can want to fund it. You can think we have to do things around the world that we're doing, but you have to take it seriously. That means look at it critically, study it critically, make tough decisions about what we need or no, don't need, and that's not what we're doing, I would argue, and I think James Fowles is making that argument. So I'll stop there, and I hope we have time for a few questions. Thank you.
who was going on. Maybe an overreaction, but it made perfect sense to begin to find out what's going on out there yeah. and who else is preparing you know, yeah. another 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is this... Uh, no, it's, it, that's an interesting point. I think, obviously... I, 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 oh, yeah. I do want a second, second point. Sure. Second point is, you didn't touch on nuclear weapons. No, no. Uh, this morning I read in the papers that they're even considering using nuclear weapons against people who are doing non-nuclear attacks. So I have yeah. four questions if you could address them. Sure. Um, well, there are a couple things. One is, uh, very quickly, uh, I could have done a whole talk about nuclear weapons and where we were going with that, because, you know, once again, unfortunately, that was another aspect of going to sleep as far as military policy was sort of letting our nuclear arsenal, we were, we were shrinking it in some ways, but sort of going to sleep as far as making tough decisions about the future of nuclear weapons. And lo and behold, enough years go by, and our nuclear arsenal does get genuinely old. It, it may be, of course, be much bigger and better than anyone else's, but in some ways, old. And so we are now at this turning point where we are making decisions about rebuilding the entire nuclear triad. Right? The, that is the land-based missiles, the sea-based missiles, the bombers, and as I list up here, whoops, oh, sorry, excuse me, uh, other things as well. So what Obama was planning on doing most of this, and again, that was the problem. The Democrats were willing to kick these cans down the road over and over again and not confront the tough decisions. And so we are now on the cusp with the Trump administration to making serious commitment. This would add, of course, greatly to the military budget to totally rebuild the military, or the nuclear arsenal. Um, and he does have a much more initial, aggressive nuclear strategy that I would argue does kind of lower the threshold, or at least the perceived threshold, of when we might consider using nuclear weapons. So between those two things, is suddenly nuclear weapons, of course, with North Korea helping in this regard, we're in back in this almost Cold War-like world as far as nuclear weapons, not just in the threat, but in the amount of money we'll be spending and the resources we'll be committing to a new nuclear arsenal. So that was the one question. Yeah, I, I, you know, the JSOC one and whether we should be using JSOC, because the question was basically like, well, maybe we're all in these countries, it's a good thing with JSOC because we're finding out what's going on and we won't be surprised. And there might be something to that. The question is, do you want the secret of army being your, your means of finding that out? Which is just an open question. Uh, because it is funny, they're all in uniform, they're all trained to be very deadly, efficient soldiers, but in some ways they are acting as intelligence operatives as well. It's a funny combination right now. There was no one in China. Well, that's probably right, actually. Now, they may not acknowledge China, but it's, it's possible there isn't anyone in China. You know, other things, yeah. We just read that China was busy uncovering a lot of our, our spies, I guess. Yes? seen that yet. I'll, I'll get to it. But yeah, that's exactly the kind of argument that's used. If you couldn't hear, it's that Trump gave a speech where he, he you know, talked about the, probably the budget agreement and the need to get this done because of our military. And notice, Democrats, that's not the other, Democrats will use the same argument, right? Oh, we shouldn't be fighting about the budget because our military, you know, needs reliable funding, which is true. I'm not arguing that. It's how much reliable funding do they need, and shouldn't we at least talk about how much we're giving them? And yes, it's true that what Trump and too many other people lie it, go over without really talking about is how much we actually are spending, right? So it's, what's this money being spent on, and what's it being spent for? Yeah. We okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we're on charity, and then, yeah. And I'll come over here. Sorry. Okay, so I, I was waiting, I was waiting for us to get to the institutional level, right, because it's the, what has this done to the state post 9-11 and all these years later, right, and it's the, it's the hollowing out of a lot of institutions at the top, such that the president has written no real power. He's the arbiter at best 
of inter intramural struggle between the different sub-institutional components of what you had up there on the screen. Right? And we, otherwise, it's very much, it's, it, it imitates what's going on in American organizations and institutions everywhere. So chancellors now become marketing men um, because they have no real powers. The powers all come from somewhere else. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and teams are deployed to, to make sure that they stick to the, to the plan. So there's that little irony to, 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 to uh, think about, and, and, and reality of just what does that mean in terms of democracy. But then the, the final one is this, this little phrase that goes around in the little mini world that I inhabit, which is what happens in places where JSOC and company are employed. And it's the, it's the phrase that's called the self-licking ice cream. Yeah. Self-licking ice cream cone is one where you, 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 turn, you turn a country into a shithole so that it produces refugees and it produces people who are really pissed off, right? And then you have to send in more troops in order to calm it down, and it floods Europe with refugees. Um, and so and you can, the whole thing just keeps going again and again. So then this becomes a justification for more funding. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and, and you know, obviously to take this in so many directions, like given the mistake of the Iraq war and all the chaos that produced, right? Then you take the chaos, and that becomes the justification for more resource. Yeah, on and on you go. And it's a great point, Terry, about the hollowing out of our, our institutions. And I think a difficult question to answer, meaning, you know, the, the idea that that in some ways even the president is kind of um, captured by these fabulously large and important and, and powerful institutions we've created in and around the wars, right? The NSA, the CIA all the things I've talked about today. And those sort of can go on and do their thing with minimal involvement from the president. And Lord knows Congress is kind of out of the picture of all this in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, they, they have the power of the purse, but they aren't using that at all. So I, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think in the interest of time, yeah. uh, we, maybe people can, can have questions. Oh, no, let's have two more. A couple more. Yeah, I don't know. Was it a fusion center in Hawaii that issued... That's a good question. I don't know. Yes. Was there office emergency services? Because the warning, strategic warning used to come from NORAD. Yeah. It would be direct. Yeah. So does it now go through a fusion center? That's a good question, Greg. Right? Yeah, I think we're all sort of now having to gear up again on the sort of systems around nuclear weapons and the war. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lincoln. I've always thought of the Vietnam War as a kind of turning point because uh, at the time that the war started, the poverty level has been going down. As soon as the war started, it went back up. And uh, we went from butter to guns. And that seemed to, we, it seems like we never stopped that trend. Well, it's interesting. I mean, they, there, there are so many things going on with the budgets, you know, in terms of the, the growth of, of um, you know, not just the military in around Vietnam, because it did go back down for a while, not long, but down, back down. But you also have, you know, the growth of all these mandatory, um, you know, welfare programs, Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare at the same time. So you do begin to get more of that guns, butter, trade-off going on. But we're certainly spending, as a percentage, you know, way more on domestic programs than defense. You know, even even if when we're spending a lot on defense because everything else is growing so much, that's an argument again that a lot of people make. Oh, this is nothing compared to other programs, right? So we should we should spend on this because historically, as a percentage of the gross national product or gross domestic product, it's actually fairly low compared to where, where it was during Vietnam and Korea, right? So we can afford it. Great, we can afford it. Should we afford it? Or, or what exactly as part of it should we afford? Not just we can afford it, right? Yes. Um, all this is in the context of huge societal changes here in the last 30 years of technology and the internet, the huge dominance of the internet, particularly starting before 2001, and that has an impact globally. And I don't see that expressed in the sense of, of some of the costs that have been, you know, you have gone over and some of the organizations, because you're, you're, you're talking about organizing of, of terrorist groups or anything else and the importance of the internet 
difference of the communication, of the ability to organize. Mm. I mean, a sort of a new military asset. Well, way. not so much military, but at, you know, poke the bad guys. Yeah. Um, you know, that they have this ability to communicate now, that organizations can be created. All this information can be out there on the internet or in social media. And that's had a huge impact yeah. in, in some of the things that are going on. So how would you have the military? How would you have the government respond to these changes is well, so much different than Korea, well, Absolutely, and, and we, um, we are, right? You know, we have a cyber command now. Right. As a symbol of this. We have the NSA, but we also have like a you know, cyber command. So the That's military right. itself is involved, and JSOC on its own is involved in knowing about these things yeah. and countering them, right? So what works That's, and what doesn't work? That's a good question, yeah, yeah. You know, that's obviously an area where it's so classified, right, that in many cases we don't know, right? For example, you know, with Iran and the nuclear centrifuges, there's no doubt the United States created and used this Stuxnet program. So that's our one example where we know something we did and to some extent whether it worked, right? Yeah. But there's obviously so many things that we're doing that we, we don't know about. Or things that are also be down down to us. That's quite possible, right? So. <laughs> on, on that note, I think we have to close. So we could go on for two hours because everybody knows about this.